Good morning, and welcome to the fourth lecture of the course, Making Modern. I am Justina Crawford, Manager of Lectures, Courses, and Concerts. This series is generously supported by the Aji Dajani Lecture Fund. Today we will hear a painting from the past presented by Leila Bermeo, Kristen and Roger Service and Assistant Curator in the Art of America's Department. Before joining the MFA in September 2016, Layla was the co-curator of the Harvard University's Black History slash Art History Lecture and Performance Series and a guest curator at the African American Museum in Philadelphia. She has held curatorial fellowships at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the Williams College Museum of Art and recently completed the Center for Curatorial Leadership Mellon Foundation Seminar in Curatorial Practice. A graduate of Northwestern University, Layla earned her master's degree from the Williams College Graduate Program in the History of Art and is currently a PhD candidate in the Department of History of Art and Architecture at Harvard University. Please join me in welcoming Layla Bermeo. Thank you so much, Justina. I'm so happy to be here this morning to talk about a handful of artists related to the Making Modern installation that's currently on view on the third floor of the Art of the Americas wing. I would also like to thank Elliot Boswick Davis, the John Moores Cabot Chair of Art of the Americas, and Erica Herschler, the Kroll Senior Curator of American Paintings, for the invitation and for their support of my work, as well as the paintings conservator Irene Kohnfall, who's helped me think a little bit about materials and processes of 20th century painters, a project that I hope to return to later. Finally, I would like to thank all of you for being here, as I realize it's a little bit of a gamble. Uh, many of you do not know me yet, and that's because I am the newest curator here at the MFA. Um, I started this position in the fall, which means that I was not part of the team that worked on the Making Modern installation. If you've been joining this lecture series throughout, you may have heard from my colleague, Katie Hansen, who's the assistant curator of European paintings, and you will hear eventually from Elliot Davis, I think later this month, um, again, who's the chair who spearheaded this innovative installation. My perspective will be a little bit different, um, and I would uh, like to discuss some of the themes that jump out to me um, as I look through the installation, which is particularly strengthened by highlights from the Lane Collection. I will also talk a little bit about issues that I'll be thinking through as we continue to think about new rotations and installations and themes for the third floor. Here in the Art of the Americas, we are responsible for materials dating from colonial contact up to about 1955 and sometimes beyond. This chronological breadth is one of the most exciting things about joining this department, but I would be lying if I said that my heart wasn't in the 19th century. And that's because for me, many of the developments in the 20th century, what we often think of as modern, were foreshadowed in the 19th century, which was the, the great age of industry, mass communication, and the beginnings of art museums and schools in this country. So we can keep this in mind when we look at the opening wall text of Making Modern, which is installed next to a picture of the Brooklyn Bridge, which was constructed in 1883, but painted by Joseph Stella in 1941. It asks us, what does modern mean? For the artists on this floor, it meant creating a new language, one that could speak to individual vision in a time of increasing complexity. One theme that runs through these galleries is the conversation between artists, both of the past and the present. It is these issues of the past that I am interested in, and what will be the focus of today's discussion on Marston Hartley, Arthur Dove, and Charles Sheeler. These three artists are firmly associated with the beginnings of modernism in the United States, with their interest in geometry, flat panes of color heralded as precursors to abstract expressionism that would finally situate the US as the capital of modern art, no longer overshadowed by Europe. They are often tied to a standard trajectory of modern art because all three were exposed to cubism in Paris in the years between 1906 and 1913, and mentored by the influential photographer and art dealer, Alfred Stieglitz. And Stieglitz will come up throughout this lecture because in this period, he introduced to artists and to the public the latest European avant-garde creations. It was in Stieglitz's gallery that Picasso, Cezanne, and Matisse had their first exhibitions in New York. And it was through camera work, his publication, that the latest ideas about art spread throughout the United States. But importantly, ideas of modernity do not always come from where we might expect. And I would argue that many ideas about modernism grew out of the 19th century rather than the 20th century. 
Importantly, two of these artists, Marsden Hartley and Charles Sheeler, studied with William Merritt Chase, who, as many of us learned from Erica Herschler's recent exhibition, was himself a modern master. His subjects, portraits, interiors, and outdoor scenes of leisure may seem like traditions from the Victorian era, but if we look closely at his technique, we can see the way that he anticipated abstraction in the United States. This is one example of many that some of you may have seen where Chase is able to just perfectly describe the fall of fabric, something that is very much in the physical world, but to do so with brushwork that really anticipates painting that we'll see much later, 50, 60 years later. Technique is just one of the issues that I hope we can talk about today in order to move these artists out of the simple trajectory of seeing works by Picasso and selling their works with Stieglitz. Such a discussion, I hope, will give us not only a fuller understanding of these artists, but also a richer narrative about modernism. And I just want to mention today that I've organized my talk in terms of the three artist biographies, which is a little bit of an old-fashioned method, but we're talking about the past, so I think we're allowed to be a little old-fashioned. So we're going to start with Marsden Hartley. Marsden Hartley was born in Lewiston, Maine in 1877. And after living and working in Cleveland, New York, Paris, Berlin, Santa Fe, Mexico City, and visiting still other places throughout North America and Europe, he returned to Maine, where he died in 1943. And here we're seeing a Stieglitz portrait of Hartley, um, uh, the photograph uh, on your left. Um, from early in his career, early in Hartley's career, and then a painting done by Milton Avery in the last year of his life. Some of you may be familiar with Hartley's long-lasting engagement with his home state of Maine, which is the subject of a current major exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Should you get a chance to see the show, either at the Met or at the Colby College Museum of Art, you may recognize two paintings on loan from the MFA, Carnival of Autumn and Black Duck. Like the hill, also in our collection, Carnival of Autumn is an early landscape by Hartley, created in a moment when his brush strokes became thicker and his colors brighter. He was actively seeking his identity at this time, both as an artist and as a person. He had been born as Edmund Hartley and gradually incorporated Marsden, the last name of his beloved stepmother, into his own name. And we can see that in this early advertisement um, for art classes that he was offering in, Lewis, in Lewiston. You'll notice that although classes are, um, are held on Saturdays, arrangements may be made for classes on other days. <laughs> Throughout his life, he came from a low-income family and struggled financially, um, so especially early on, his um, teaching practice was critical to maintaining his dream of becoming an artist. In 1908, around the time when he created those early landscapes, he began simply calling himself Marsden Hartley and drawing self-portraits, including one of himself as a draftsman. The short, quick, overlapping lines that we see in these drawings recall the thick, tapestry-like brushstrokes of Impressionists and Post-Impressionists, whose work he came to know through Boston collector Desmond Fitzgerald. And on the screen here, um, you see on the left a work by Monet that Fitzgerald collected. It's now in our collection. Um, and he owned this around the time that he met Hartley. He also exposed Hartley to post-impressionists post -impressionists with ties to Massachusetts, such as Maurice Prendergast on the top there, and uh, watercolorist Dodge McKnight. Like the Japanese prints that, feel, that filled Hartley's studio, these works represent very modern influences, an emphasis on experimenting with bold compositions in geometric forms. I find it so interesting that the triangle of the skirt in the Monet, and we see it also here with this haystack, kind of anticipates um, the landscapes that we see from Hartley much later in the 20th century. However, even as Hartley drew his influences from modern painting, he did not represent the modernities that shaped the landscape itself. His main landscapes, both early and late, do not include any evidence of highways, power lines, or mills ubiquitous in factory towns like Lewiston. In this way, Hartley differs from other painters closely associated with American geographies during the first half of the 20th century, such as the Midwestern regionalists. Artists like Thomas Hart Benton, Grant Wood, and John Stuart Curry were actually more likely to include images of cars, telephones, and other signs of modern life, even as their works overwhelmingly focused on scenes of rural America. Hartley's sustained interest in creating a pastoral landscape 
an ideal natural world removed from the realities of modern industrialization and urbanization, perhaps puts him more in conversation with someone like Thomas Cole, widely considered to be the first major landscape painter in the United States. Even as Hartley painted in a modern style, some of his ideas were in tune with those that marked the very beginnings of landscape tradition in this country. Hartley's landscapes were well received by Alfred Stieglitz, the gatekeeper of modern art in New York at the time, and he hung an exhibition of works similar to The Hill in his 291 gallery in 1909. Hartley described the gallery as the largest small room in the world, likely because the works of art within the space, paintings by masters like Picasso, Cezanne, and Matisse, were like windows that transported him to places he never knew existed. Stieglitz became not only his art dealer, but also his counselor and confidant. And here we see a photo of them by the artist Dorothy Norman. On the left, Stieglitz, himself a photographer, leans toward the camera, while Hartley sits back, more reserved. And I'm fascinated by this little burst of light where their shoulders overlap. Um, that looks like a visible spark of energy or creativity between them. <laughs> Soon after meeting Stieglitz, Hartley took his first trip to Europe, visiting Paris and Berlin. It was during his time abroad, and particularly during his time in Germany, when he began to most strongly base his work on notions of the past. When Hartley arrived in Berlin in 1913, he faced the brewing tensions of World War I and the personal stresses of financial problems. In a letter to Stieglitz in June, he lamented, quote, here I sit in another spot in Europe, knowing it is Europe and knowing it is also but another place to pitch a tent, for I am homeless, actually, spiritually, and every other way. And there's no saying buck up and be different, for it is myself and I must always be that and be true to it and live with it best I can, for I am eternally alone with it." End quote. Hartley's biographers have connected his lifelong feelings of isolation, such as those expressed in his letter to Stieglitz, to his homosexuality. Regarding Hartley's description of himself as homeless, a wanderer always on the outside looking in, Bruce Robertson has written, quote, the stress on looking is only natural for a painter, but for Hartley, it had a particular urgency. He looked because he could not participate, because he could not touch. As a gay man, Hartley felt that all ordinary expressions of love were forbidden him, especially the life of home or domesticity, end quote. But Hartley's outlook significantly changed during his, the course of his stay in Germany as he formed friendships and garnered the attention of avant-garde art dealers. As an American traveling abroad, he still felt different the way he had all his life, but perhaps it was a new kind of difference, one that could be openly expressed or even controlled. Growing aware of the German fascination for myths of the American frontier and Native American culture, Hartley decided to create a series of paintings that explored the idea of America. Called the America series, spelled with a German K, these works enabled Hartley to play into stereotypes of American life that rewarded European assumptions and secure his identity in ways that he couldn't before. Tasking himself with creating pictures of America while he was living outside of America, Hartley visited ethnographical museums like the Museum for Wunderkunde in Berlin, where he could see Native American clothing, teepees, canoes, and totem poles, objects that would appear in reduced form throughout his America series. By encountering these objects enshrined in European museums rather than among the living communities that they came from, Hartley was likely understanding Native American cultures as firmly in the past, long ago vanished in the face of modernity. And here we can see a turn of the century image of um, the ethnographic museum in Berlin and there's well-dressed people who are looking at totem poles and teepees underneath these grand columns and vaulted ceilings. Such impressions were shared by many, if not most, people in the United States and Europe at the time, and such ideas were underscored by storybooks and movies that situated Native Americans as perpetually in the Old West, never keeping up with the times. Hartley himself expressed such a fantasy in a 1914 letter to Stieglitz when he wrote, quote, I find myself wanting to be an Indian, to paint my face with the symbols of that race I adore, to go west and face the sun forever. End quote. 
Hartley undoubtedly encountered many examples of Native American art that he admired for their repeating patterns, bold colors, and rhythmic geometric forms. And perhaps he even admired the peoples who had developed visual strategies of abstraction long before artists trained in Western traditions. However, his quote betrays the willful misunderstandings about Native American communities in the period. His association of Indians with the West, even as Mi'kmaq and other Wabanaki peoples lived in Maine during Hartley's lifetime, and of course still do. And his notion of facing the sun forever. It's a beautiful image, but one that implies stasis, lack of change, a people frozen in time. Why was it important for artists like Hartley to situate Native Americans in the past to divorce them from contemporary culture? If Native Americans and their work of art were distanced culturally and temporally, images associated with them were freely available to be recreated and modified within the work of white, European, and American artists. This practice, particularly during the first half of the 20th century, is usually referred to as primitivism and typically includes the fusion of different artistic styles. Art historian Wanda Korn has described Hartley's fusions of imagery in the Americas series, writing, Quote, like most of his artist counterparts, Hartley was not a serious student of Indian history. He cavalierly fused the woodland tribes who used canoes with the Plains Indians who lived in teepees and on important occasions wore feather bonnets. Furthermore, for a ser series dedicated to the American Indian, Hartley freely mixed in motifs from other cultures, the Buddha from the East, mummies and pyramids from Egypt, the mandorla and cross from Christianity, and the eight-pointed stars with the eagle from multiple cultures including America and the Imperial German military. We can perhaps see some of these combinations at play in the painting in our collection, Arrangement Hieroglyphics, in which a TP-like shape slices through the center of the painting, its triangular shape reversed and echoed by yellow and blue and white bands of color arranged diagonally. These sharp geometries float above a round concentric circle that anchors the bottom of the painting, reminiscent of a Plains Indian shield as well as a shooting target. Hartley uses the same colors throughout the composition, but rarely in an exactly alternating pattern, offering constant surprises across the canvas that continue on to the painted frames. His feelings of freedom in Berlin extended to his free appropriation of native imagery, and the brilliant colors suggest his optimism before the official outbreak of World War I, which would force him to return to the United States. At the time when Hartley painted arrangement hieroglyphics, he had never visited the West that he imagined. He had actually never been west of Cleveland. A couple of years after meeting the art patron Mabel Dodge Luhan in 1916, Hartley visited her home in Taos, New Mexico, and also spent time in Santa Fe. Now living among vibrant Native communities, Hartley did not paint Native subjects, making only pastel drawings of the surrounding landscape. Working throughout his life as a poet and an author, Hartley spent this time writing about his experiences, seeking to contribute to the anthropological discourse about Native Americans that was beginning to circulate widely in intellectual circles. He described his travels to New Mexico as a quest for national identity, writing, quote, I am an American discovering America, end quote. Although interestingly, New Mexico had officially only become part of the United States very recently, gaining statehood in 1912. Hartley continued on to say, quote, as a painter, I am impressed with the fact that America as a landscape is, one might rightly say, untouched. But he couldn't render these untouched landscapes in oil on sight. It was only a few years later, when he returned to Berlin, that he painted the New Mexican landscape from memory. Calling his series New Mexico Recollections, Hartley once again placed his encounters with Native American culture in the past, this time his own. Hartley found inspiration not only in American concepts of the past, but also in historic German folk art. During his first visit to Germany, he met Vasily Kandinsky, the pioneering abstract painter, Kandinsky was interested in the traditional folk art of Bavaria and Bohemia, particularly in reverse painting on glass, and encouraged the collecting and making of glass paintings among artists in Munich. While in Germany, Hartley also collected glass paintings, but didn't attempt to make any of his own until he returned to the United States, and stayed at the Ogunquit Art Colony in 1917, which is where the painter, critic, and collector, Hamilton Easterfield, was encouraging modern artists to learn from folk traditions. 
And just to explain this slide, I'm sorry, there's no caption. Um, on the left, you're seeing uh, an example of um, a traditional 18th or 19th century Bavarian reverse painting on glass. There were a lot of votive subjects, but interestingly, even the religious scenes included these really interesting floral motifs um, that were picked up also in Hartley's work. Scholars have noted that Hartley's simplified still life arrangements share more with the compositions found in American reverse painting on glass and that he was also interested in Victorian saloon and shop signs, which would place his work in a 19th century United States context. However, Hartley painted from memory throughout his life, mixing his own past experiences with broader historic narratives and objects. The MFA's own tinseled flowers recalls the votive paintings of Germany and the floral still lifes made in the United States. It represents the collision of the past that Hartley was learning about and the two countries that he was living in. Just as Hartley's first trip to Germany exposed him to folk traditions that would show up in his later work, it was during this formative journey that he first met writer and art patron Gertrude Stein, who would shape his artistic career. Stein's works included novels, plays, stories, and humorous poems, but perhaps one of her most innovative works was the 1933 autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, written in the guise of an autobiography authored by Toklas, her life partner. It was a great commercial success, perhaps not only because of its accessible story, but also because biographies of all kinds became very popular in the interwar period, when audiences in the United States longed for stories about individual Americans. A voracious reader and prolific writer, Hartley read historic biographies of saints and religious figures, as well as radical new works like Stein's. Late in his career, while he was still actively reading biographies, Hartley began creating portraits, which he referred to as archaic works inspired by ancient Fayum portraits and the early Renaissance masters. Hartley created archaic portraits of figures he admired, sometimes rendering specific people, such as the painter Albert Pingham Ryder, and other times creating types, like fishermen or athletes. Although Ryder had died a few decades before and the fishermen subjects could be considered tinged with nostalgia, the only portrait that was truly a historic, if not archaic, was that of Abraham Lincoln, which was likely inspired by Carl Sandburg's widely popular biography of him. Lincoln became the homegrown hero that Americans needed as World War II drew closer with its threats of foreign invasion. Hartley wrote two of his own poems about Lincoln and painted three portraits, none of which really resemble each other. Hartley perhaps intuitively understood that Lincoln himself knew the power of the reproducible image, as just after painting the MFA's version called The Great Good Man, he wrote to his friend, the artist Carl Sprinkhorn, quote, Lincoln's is the one great face for me, and I never tire of looking at it. He was photoed so often, each time so different. Hartley cut at least four photographs of Lincoln from the newspaper and owned a print of Lincoln as he appeared directly after his nomination in 1860. The Great Good Man is based on an 1862 photograph of Lincoln by Civil War photographer Matthew Brady, and the painting unites this historic image with the bold color and graphic strength of American folk art. Here, perhaps we see the most recognizable evidence of stories and media from the past shaping Hartley's modern art. Around the same time that Gertrude Stein published the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, Hartley began the manuscript for his own autobiography titled, Somehow a Past, but it remained unpublished during his life. The Great Good Man was completed a year before his death, and in uniting so many different influences from his artistic life, his interest in literature, his mastery of modern painting techniques, the influences of folk art of Germany and the United States, and of course, his underlying dedication to an unshakable American history, traceable all the way to his early work. I wonder if this painting might serve as a Marsden Hartley autobiography of sorts. Arthur Dove. Arthur Dove and Marsden Hartley were almost exact contemporaries, and though they were both and they were both mentored by Alfred Stieglitz and both traveled to France early in their careers. However, while in France, Dove's activities as a painter remained confined largely to rural settings. Although the, the cosmopolitan circle of Gertrude Stein was within his social reach, he did not seek it out. Born in the Finger Lakes region of New York and raised in the nearby town of Geneva, 
Dev gravitated to quieter rural settings throughout his life, even after he began showing his paintings in New York City. In 1910, shortly after he returned from Europe, he bought a farm in Westport, Connecticut, with hopes that it would yield enough income to support his family and also provide him with an opportunity to closely study the subject that has, had held his attention since childhood, the regenerative cycles of nature. One of the earliest works by Dove in the MFA's collection seems to be not only about nature, but also about industry, it is, as it is part of a series of drawings of mills and factories that he did between 1911 and 1916. However, here, as in all of Dove's works that focus on mechanical processes, nature still plays a transformative role. The mill is reduced to flat, geometric planes, and its sharp outlines are softened by the atmospheric effects of the shading done in charcoal. And although the mill is positioned in the center of the drawing, it is nestled between rolling hills in the background and a reflective pond in the foreground. His drawings differed from those of his contemporaries like Martin Schomburg, who celebrated the, sle the sleekness and great possibilities of machine age design. While Schomburg pictured industrial implements floating in white spaces, separated from the natural world, Dove's integrated images of mills and landscape emphasized their continued reliance on it. Like many people in the United States between 1910 and 1920, Dove felt alienated by the pervasive materialism of an increasingly industrialized America, a point of view shared by Stieglitz and other intellectuals. Such rejection of a growing industrialization and urbanization justified Dove's difficult lifestyle as a farmer in Westport, a town that had begun to attract like-minded artists and writers, among them the literary critic and historian Van Wyck Brooks. Brooks was one of the loudest voices lamenting the lack of history in the United States, arguing that American writers and artists did not have an identifiable literary tradition that they could aspire to be a part of. He worried about the ways that the, quote, creeping paralysis of the, mechanis of the mechanistic view of life might affect future generations, and set about writing biographies of 19th century authors, including Mark Twain, Walt Whitman, and Washington Irving. His 1918 essay on creating a usable past proved to be particularly influential as it suggested that Americans could sele selectively pick bright moments from history and weave them into a cohesive narrative that would solidify an American identity separate from European models, a task that became increasingly urgent around the time of World War I. The notion of artists with a singularly American native vision as promoted by Stieglitz and specifically applied to Dove harmonized perfectly with the nationalist sentiments that were bound to ideas about the American past. Although Dove created contemporary art, he lived a seemingly old-fashioned life, one that reflected the nation's founding ideals. Dove abandoned his life as a farmer, however, and his first wife around 1921, when he met artist Helen Tor in Westport. They moved onto his boat, the Mona, where they lived and made art together for seven years. And if you visit the gallery, um, if you visit Gallery 326 on level three, you can see two paintings by Dove and, and Tor hanging together um, and really get an interest, I think, of some of the, or you can get a sense of some of the interests that they shared. Um, both of these canvases experiment with cascading forms that seem to grow larger or even louder at the bottom. And Dove is known to have listened to music while he painted. Um, so we could guess from this particular pairing that sound and music were very influential to both of them. During this time, Dove worked as a commercial illustrator. Provided, Dove's work as a commercial illustrator provided the main source of income for Tor and himself, but the dramatic changes to his lifestyle also caused him to rethink the ways that he made his fine art. Tor would later recall, quote, one day he said, I'm tired of putting brush strokes on canvas. After the next walk we took on the other side of the water in Hailsight, he collected leaves and things and made his first collage. Dove's collages were, like par were likely partially inspired by the work of cubists like Picasso and Dadas like Kurt Schwitters, who interrupted artistic media like oil on canvas with everyday found materials and printed ephemera. We can think of these works as a modernist critique of the materials traditionally associated with fine art, and a blurring of the separation between the art of painting and the lowbrow designs of mass-produced images and typefaces. Although Dove may have been interested in these new ideas, 
his collages arguably harken back to narratives of the past. By using organic materials like twigs, leaves, and grass, Dove's Long Island collage evokes the passing of seasons and the sentimental collecting of autumn leaves and pressed flowers. Such themes of the past become more literal in certain examples from his series of collages. In a work titled Grandmother, shown on the left, he incorporated actual pressed flowers next to those created in needlepoint. Despite the radiating abstract composition created by pieces of bamboo pole in the collage on the right, its folksy title, Goin' Fishin', gives it a similarly sentimental aura. The critic, which we see in the center, is Dove's biting portrait of Royal Cortezos, the reigning proponent of realist art. With a single glass lens to represent his narrow vision, Cortezos is dressed in a suit made up of a newspaper article reviewing an exhibition of paintings by Thomas Aikens, George Lukes, and John Singer Sargent. Curiously, this article is written by Lukes himself. Um, you can, I don't think you can see it on the slide, but there's a byline up here that mentions that it's by Lukes, Lukes himself, and then there is a um, byline down here that proclaims all three are important figures to the story of American art. So himself, Aikens, and Sargent. Unlike Lukes, it seems like Dev was probably uninterested in positioning himself as the heir to 19th century masters. But the recurrent themes of memory and collecting, along with his Ralph Waldo Emerson-inspired understanding of nature, suggest that he was not immune to Victorian sentimentalities. Working on small scales while living aboard his boat, Dev began to pare down his collages into simpler compositions and experiment with different supports to create new light and surface effects. Two collages that are currently on view in Making Modern, the C number one and Clouds, are both created on rigid metallic supports. So rather than using paper or board as he had done in his other collages, Dove worked directly on sheets of aluminum and zinc. In the C, shown on the left, he glued paper, sand, and gauze onto a sheet of scratched aluminum delicately evoking the play of light on the water. The silvery tone of the aluminum, which, shift, which shifts slightly when viewed through the applied gauze, creates a moody, atmospheric effect of a humid evening. As in clouds, created a couple of years later, real sand marks the beach, a texture that he perhaps could not recreate in any other media. In these works, Dove begins to fuse found objects with paint, so that we have to look harder to find the non-traditional media. But even as he begins to work more subtly, or even more abstractly, as we see in clouds, I am struck by the way that he maintained certain shapes and compositional strategies. I'm thinking here of the hulking, curving forms in the background, and then also the way in which this um, shape of the leaf, which is kind of swollen and then tapers at the end, um, is really reminiscent of some of these cloud shapes. In 1933, following the death of Dove's mother, he and Tor moved back to Geneva, New York. Although his experiments with materials had started on the boat, it was in returning to the place that he'd grown up in that triggered his most interesting, interesting uses of media and some of his strongest paintings. Dove's mother had left him and his brother an estate that included multiple homes and, bri and brick and tile plants, which had been the business of Dove's late father. But in their typical fashion, Dove and Tor chose to forego modern comforts and instead set up their studios in a house without electricity or running water. Dove revisited his boyhood pastimes of fishing, hunting, and chopping wood, and began sketching his surroundings in watercolor. Dove's transition from making three-dimensional collages into using watercolor is perhaps less unexpected than it may seem. Although because watercolors are generally categorized as, as drawings and not paintings, we tend to think of them as flat works on paper. The medium of watercolor itself, however, is made up of pigments held together by a water-soluble binder, such as gum arabic. As a solvent, water thins the color, which you can see here in the form of hardened bricks color, and shakes loose the pigment. So watercolor is always a little bit rocky, giving an effect that is not so different from Dove's suspending grades of sand and oil, just much less noticeable. <laughs> 
In addition, working with watercolor gave Dev the opportunity to experiment with but to experiment with creating transparent layers of color and leaving the support visible. So here we can see how Dove has brushed on the watercolor in broad strokes, leaving large swaths of the paper um, uncovered. So particularly in these um, spaces where not the white part, but this kind of taupe color is just the bare paper. His interest in layering and explorations of the ways in which colors and textures below can change those that we see on the surface soon extended to his works on canvas. Significantly, paintings like Sun on the Lake were no longer simply made up of oil, but created from layers of oil, wax, and resin sitting atop the canvas. So where did Dove get this idea to create paintings with these radically new materials? from the art of the past, of course. Around 1935, soon after it had been translated into English, Dove found himself reading every inch of the materials of the artist, a technical manual by German artist and theorist Max Dorner. Subtitled, With Notes on the Techniques of the Old Masters, the volume detailed the Byzantine method for mixing grounds, Italian Renaissance ways of grinding pigments, and resurrected the ancient traditions of painting with, with wax and tempera. Struck by the possibilities of such a guidebook, Dove wrote to Stieglitz, quote, wish I had it years ago. Georgia said she reads it like the Bible. He referred here to Georgia O'Keeffe, with whom he shared his interest in representing the natural world and zooming in on leaves, branches, and shells until they became unfamiliar and abstract. O'Keeffe, however, remained devoted to working in oil on canvas, meticulously honing her technique and never really incorporating non-traditional media. Dove, by comparison, seized the opportunity to stretch the possibilities of oil by mixing it with wax and resin and layering it over a ground with yet even more different materials. He heavily annotated his copy of Dorner's book and for a period of time recorded the specific colors and media that he used, but likely departed from the standardized recipes in the text, inventing new methods even as he studied old ones. Dove's motorboat from 1938 is one such painting from this period for which he mixed the ground and the layers of oil, wax, and resin that would cover it. Scholars have noted the way that the painting oscillates between abstraction and figuration. Dove flattened space and played rhythmic shapes off of one another to create an overall pattern of jagged trees and undulating hills and waves. The whimsical anchor shape in the center establishes a link to the, visible, to, the visible, to the visible world that would otherwise be difficult to discern, allowing us to see the pointed bow of a, of a boat speeding through the water, waves splashing up on either side. The composition is unified by the varying hues of blue that extend across the foreground, middle ground, and background, changes in color and transparency that are made possible by areas in which the oil paint is made heavier with wax. Even as Dove experimented with different media and introduced radically different images, he followed the age-old tradition of painting fat over lean, as prescribed in Dorner's book, and the thickest layers of, of his work tend to sit on the very surface. And even though the subject of the motorboat evokes the speed of modern life, he likely made this work at an old-fashioned pace, spending hours making his own materials. Despite his energetic and fruitful experiments with media in Geneva and the groundbreaking work that he produced there, Dove and Tor longed to return to the ocean, and in 1838, they moved to the north shore of Long Island. They moved into a cottage that had once been a post office and then a general store, its location on the water likely convenient for 19th century shipping. This historically charged place, where Dove would spend the rest of his life, allowed them to be surrounded by nature while remaining within close proximity to New York City, which they were never intellectually or socially removed from, even as they cultivated a rural lifestyle. It was here where Dove, decades after publicly stating that there was no such thing as abstraction, would record in a 1942 diary entry that he had made abstract painting. Dove's full self-endorsed engagement with abstraction is perhaps most visible in the titles from some of his works from this period, which unlike the slightly earlier motorboat, do not seem to reference the imagery in the painting. 
These works also demonstrate Dove's broad definition of abstraction and a range of ways to achieve it. A few shapes on the left suggest Dove's belief in the viability of geometric forms as a subject for painting without referencing anything else. And in the cryptically titled Neighborly Attempt at Murder, a tree stands alone, a tree stands in for the death of Dove's neighbor, killed in a violent act which he overheard one night and eventually translated onto canvas, leaving out any hints of human presence. Although these works remain connected to his immediate experiences and interests in the early 1940s, the color palettes, rhythmic shapes, and textured surfaces still remind me of works from his own past, his collages from the 1920s, perhaps indicating that the lessons that he learned from working in three-dimensional materials were absorbed into his later, more two-dimensional works. Writing about the blurring of boundaries between media, Dove typed an undated note that describes, quote, Sculpture in a different sense, raised or lowered to meet the attention or feelings as forms recede from the eye. That can be done with just paint. Dove's interest in creating forms that move forward and backward in space, taking on different levels of depth, is here joined with his confidence in the media of oil paint, which, which could create three-dimensional effects without the addition of three-dimensional objects. While some artists would handle this problem by using strategies of perspective and modeling, Dove found that fortifying his paint with wax and resin allowed him to accomplish this. Around the same time that Dove completed A Few Shapes and Neighborly Attempt at Murder, he was reading the letters of Vincent van Gogh, an engagement with a historic master that perhaps had long inspired his handling of paint and interest in radical combinations of colors. Here, it is helpful to remember that as a media, wax painting not only creates different textures and depths, but also different colors. The technique suspends pigment within wax, creating thick colors that dry with a distinct matte surface, creating soft areas of overlapping color, even in works like Square on the Pond, in which Dove's shapes are strongly geometric. Dove suffered a heart attack in 1939 and although he would continue to make ambitious paintings, his series of watercolors between 1940 and his death in 1946 reflect his need to work on a smaller scale in the face of failing health. The leaf-like forms in the upper left show Dove's continued fascination with forms of nature, which would define his work in all media throughout his career, even as he became increasingly devoted to abstraction. The other two watercolors that we see here show his continued experimentation with floating shapes and glowing colors in an undefined space, and his interest in developing patterns only to interrupt them. I would argue here that Dove returned to watercolor in order to work out the effects of surface, shape, and color that would appear in his late paintings. One of the most important 20th century paintings in the Art of the Americas collection, that red one, began as a tiny watercolor and was completed as a major work that masterfully integrates Dove's careful studies of form and color. One of the darkest colors, the floating black circle near the top of the canvas, is also one of the most transparent, and it's possible to see the bold vertical stripes underneath it. And although the colors seem simple, arranged in sweeping bands of primary red, blue, and yellow, they shift in tone and hue, built up with wax in some areas and left thinner in others. He continued to mix wax into his oil paints up to his last paintings, which exemplifies the tight bond between his development of abstract compositions and his leveraging of different materials, drawn from his study of Dorner's book of historic techniques. Although Dove once quipped, I'd rather have today than yesterday, his forward-looking paintings always relied on the processes of the past. Charles Sheeler. Although he would outlive Arthur Dove by nearly 20 years, Charles Scheler was only born three years after him, and they both visited Paris around the same year, 1909. Describing the transformational experience of seeing the paintings of Picasso, Matisse, and Braque, Scheler wrote, quote, an indelible line had been drawn between the past and the future, and I was pointed in a new direction with an entirely new concept of a picture. While it was certainly true for many artists that seeing the paintings of the European avant-garde introduced new definitions of what art could be, 
The corresponding binary between past and present that Scheler established was much more porous than indelible. The earliest Scheler painting in our collection, for example, Three White Tulips from 1912, shows not only the strong influences of Cezanne, but also the ceramics produced by the Pennsylvania German communities in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Scheler would remain engaged with the history of his native state throughout his life. As early as 1910, he spent numerous weekends exploring rural Bucks and Lancaster counties, the heart of what was then referred to as Pennsylvania Dutch country. A dower chest that he once owned features ornamental panels of symmetrically arranged, schematically drawn tulips, a favorite motif of the Pennsylvania Germans, arrayed much as Scheler does in three white tulips. Scheler had easy access to collecting historic furniture and decorative arts after he and his friend, fellow Philadelphia-born artist Morton Schomburg, began renting an 18th century stone house on the outskirts of Doylestown, Pennsylvania. His landlord was Henry Chapman Mercer, founder of a pottery that manufactured ornamental tiles and a talented amateur archeologist. Some of you may be familiar with the Mercer Museum in Doylestown, which Henry Chapman Mercer founded in 1916, building a castle for it so that it would be large enough to hold historic objects of scale, including a whale boat, a stagecoach, and a Conestoga wagon. It was within this atmosphere of antiquarianism that Scheler painted his Cezanne-inspired still lifes and where he and Schomburg both decided to take up photography as a way to financially support their painting practices. They both soon learned, however, that photography was an excellent tool for helping them see the modernist qualities of flatness, geometry, and overlapping shapes in their everyday surroundings. They used their cameras to crop views of architecture rendering them as cubist abstractions. But while Schomburg was drawn to the urban spaces of rooftops and alleys, Scheler found radical compositions within the interiors of their historic home, dramatically photographing the original hearth, wooden doorways, and iron hardware. These early photographs were celebrated in some of Scheler's first exhibitions, and they seemed to anticipate his mature work distilling the qualities of crisp lines and clear vision that would lead to his later success and inspire critics and historians to later refer to him as a precisionist. His sophisticated images of staircases with their disorienting perspectives that relied only on straight lines now seem particularly ahead of their time, both for his personal work and for modern art in general. Scheler shared with Schomburg an appreciation for the sleek designs of the machine age, even at one point drawing a self-portrait that positioned his own body as a reflection superimposed on the form of a telephone. And it's difficult to see this, especially on, on this slide. Originally, when I saw, this, um, saw the image of this work, I assumed that the telephone was simply an avatar for Scheler's body, especially because it looks like it's standing upright with a head. Um, but in fact, if you look closer, you can actually see the reflection of a suit and a neck in the window that is in the background. And so it actually is the self-portrait, um, which he would have drawn of his own reflection. And in this way, the, what's interesting about the phone is that it kind of lines up about where his heart would be. So it makes it look as though the machine is kind of like a functioning of internal organs. I think. <laughs> Importantly, Scheler's path to depicting industrial subjects was not linear, nor was his integration of the processes of photography and painting. Around 1925, years after creating the ultra-modern looking photographs of his Doylestown house, he continued to emulate Cezanne's still lifes in works like Peaches in a Bowl on the left. Although at this point, the tightly framed and cropped composition certainly suggests his own vision framed through a camera lens. The painting on the right, Lady of the 60s, seems almost unrecognizable as a work by Scheler, and indeed scholars have considered it to be a joke of sorts, a spoof of outdated portraiture. Such an interpretation, however, does not undo the fact that Scheler modeled this work on a historic photograph as he was beginning at the moment in which he was beginning to draw and paint more and more from his own, fo own photos. A figurative painting like this one was destined to remain an oddball throughout his career, 
and he did paint it on commission, but only shortly before he took a job photographing famous people for Condé Nast publications. This job, which he described as a daily trip to jail, put Scheler at the forefront of modern life. He was literally a photographer of fashion, of New York fashion, but he remained captivated by images and objects from the past. In the 19-teens, Scheler established connections with several New York City artists, gallery owners, and collectors who would encourage him to work in painting and drawing as well as in photography, including Alfred Stieglitz, Marius de Zayas, Walter and Louise Ehrensberg, and Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. As his interdisciplinary practice developed, Scheler also created short films with Morton Schomburg, Paul Strand, and his future wife, Catherine Bayard Schaefer. After a handful of, living, a handful of years living in New York, Scheler and Catherine moved to the royal commu rural community of South Salem, New York, into a house that he described as a bungalow-like building out in the hills by an old church and graveyard, surrounded by a stone wall with a convenient bootlegger down the road. The house gave them ample space for their growing collection of early American decorative arts and furniture and became the site of several of Scheler's paintings in the 1920s and 30s. The architecture in the background of spring interior, including the stairs on the left that appear three-dimensional on the bottom before escalating into flat stripes at the top of the canvas, the thinly painted red brick, and the fireplace mantle on the right created with nested rectangles is undoubtedly representative of this home in South Salem. Unlike the photographs of Scheler's Doylestown house, where the interiors were largely uninterrupted by organic forms, here a burst of yellow forsythia forms a screen that we must look through. Scheler claimed to have executed this painting, quote, loosely in the course of three or four sittings without preliminary planning. But after receiving a photography commission from the Ford Motor Company and spending six weeks in France, Scheler decided to seek out a greater compactness of design and more structural security, along with a highly finished surface, by basing his compositions exactly on his photographs. Photography became his process of preliminary planning or sketching. Starting in the fall of 1927, Scheler's Ford Motor Company commission would prove to be the most important of his career. Although the assignment was clear to document the company's new, enormous, state-of-the-art manufacturing facility near the River Rouge in Michigan, he was given great independence on the project and not required to present a comprehensive narrative showing how an automobile was made. As many scholars have pointed out, his 32 finished photographs do not depict any cars at all and similarly evade any signs of human labor. Instead, he focused on the strength and scale of the machines, presenting them as though they rose from the earth fully formed and were capable of powering themselves. Similarly, in his description of Upper Deck, his best known paintings based, based on one of the River Rouge photographs, which is right across the river at um, Harvard, he eliminated his own labor claiming that the painting, quote, involved no arbitrary rearrangement because of an aesthetic impulse. These forms existed on their own terms. By employing photography to create paintings, Scheler was able to downplay his own creative gesture and rely on notions of the truth that had been associated with photography since its invention in 1839. But even as Scheler enjoyed the success of commercial photography and asserted repeatedly that Upper Deck was a watershed in his development, he became anxious that he would be accused of simply copying his photos in paint. In addition to the early associations of truth, photography had long inspired fears that it might be destructive to the art of painting. And by 1930, Scheler's art dealer, the innovative New York City gallerist Edith Halpert, grew concerned that it would be more difficult to establish Scheler as a major American painter if his reliance on photographic sources became widely known. Following her advice, Scheler distanced himself from photography. The ambivalence, and even the pain of this decision, is thematized in his 1931 painting, View of New York, in which we do not see skyscrapers or Central Park in the way that the title might lead us to expect, but instead, an empty chair in the lower left, and a lamp above switched off. 
the type geometry of, yes, so um, a note about the slides, if I don't put the collection, everything is in our collection, and it's incredible how much work we have. I just heard someone ask if that was ours, and it's most definitely ours on view in Making Modern. The tight geometry of the slightly open window seems to freeze the clouds outside, and on the right, a camera sits on top of a stand, shrouded in a black cloth. Edith Halpert, who we see here standing in front of Sheeler's view of New York, which you can see here on the left. Um, he not only took this photo, photo, but she is actually also wearing a dress that he designed the fabric for. <laughs> Edith Halpert asked him to give up a lot as Sheeler largely, started, ma largely stopped making and exhibiting photographs as works of art in this period, though, as we'll see, he still referred to photographs that he had taken earlier in order to complete his paintings. But his reputation as a painter grew as Halpert succeeded, despite the Great Depression, in selling his major works to important institutions and private collectors. They shared an interest in early American folk art and furniture, and many of his subjects from the first half of the 1930s were motivated by his new relationship with her. Karen Haas, the Lane Collection curator of photographs here at the MFA, has noted that although Sheeler is most often thought of as a painter of industrial subjects, his works uh, based off of the River Rouge Commission in fact make up a relatively small percentage of his total output at this time. More typical are works such as Americana and American Interior, which depicted the interiors of his South Salem home filled with historic shaker furniture, hooked rugs, pressed glass, and quilts. Halpert positioned these paintings and Sheeler himself within a longer trajectory of American artists, writing in a 1931 press release for her downtown gallery, quote, Mr. Sheeler's paintings and drawings have a distinct connection with the work of the colonial and early American painters and the folk artists of the early 19th century. Folk artists of the 19th century that she, of course, also made marketable in her gallery, referring to them as American ancestors. Halpert and Sheeler were part of, intellect of, um, of an intellectual circles that took interest in objects from the past as part of a broader public fascination with the nation's history in the interwar period, perhaps articulated most clearly in the call for a usable past by Van Wyck Brooks, which we have already touched upon. During these years, writers like Brooks produced written histories and American studies emerged in universities as people in the United States grew increasingly concerned with untangling the national history from that of Europe. These concerns, though, were also expressed materially by the and evidenced by the popularity of colonial revival as a decorating style in the 1920s and 30s, and the positioning of Shaker furniture with its clean lines, lines and emphasis on functionality as a precursor to modern American design. These interests in collecting art of the past arose in tandem with new historical societies that sought to recreate life in the past, such as Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia, which was restored in the early 1930s through funds provided by John D. and Abby Rockefeller. In 1934, Halpert made an arrangement with Abby Rockefeller to have Sheeler travel to Colonial Williamsburg to paint pictures of the recreated town. Perhaps to her surprise, Sheeler despised the rural location, penning a letter with the dismayed question, how about Siberia next? <laughs> this was perhaps one of the clearest hints in Sheeler's biography that his engagement with the past was not as straightforward as it seems, although he certainly had the clearest relationship with notions of American history of the three artists that we've discussed today. Although he is still celebrated for the connections that he, that he formed between historic American craft and modern art, scholars have critiqued the ease with which these connections were made. In her 1987 catalog essay for the major uh, MFA exhibition on Charles Sheeler, my predecessor Carol Troyan, now the Kristen and Rogers Service and Curator Emeritus of Painting, observed that his paintings of interiors, with their dramatic cropping, disorienting sight lines, and collage-like arrangement of forms, were disquieting depictions of unwelcoming spaces. She argued that the paintings were more than mere celebrations, 
and that they seem to have an ironic undertone, writing. It is hard to say whether Sheeler was speaking only personally or for his whole generation in, in, in intimidating, in, um, in uh, intimating, yeah, <laughs> a kind of hollowness in the embracing of America's past. More recently, David Peters Corbett focused on how these interiors are always empty of human presence, describing them as haunting, absent spaces in which the past remains too uncertain to grasp clearly, however urgent the need. Christina Wilson, professor of art history at Clark University in Worcester, has perhaps written the most creative extension of Cor Carol Troyan's discussion, describing his paintings in relation to the rise of period rooms in museums like the Met and the MFA, which reconstruct rooms that people cannot actually inhabit. Wilson sees an irony in Sheeler's work, a self-conscious commentary on the craze for carefully selecting and copiously collecting all things American. And she notes that many of the objects in Sheeler's paintings would have been recognizable to audiences not as things of the past, but as contemporary collectibles advertised in magazines. And here we also see that one of Sheeler's paintings was used as an advertisement for tasteful decorating in House and Garden magazine. While the same Sheeler quotes praising the simple functionality of rural design are continuously recycled, Wilson cites a quote that is perhaps even more surprising than Sheeler's Siberia question. Regarding his collection of American antiques, he said, quote, I don't like these things because they are old, but in spite of it, I'd like them still better if they were made yesterday, because then they would afford proof that the same kind of creative power is continuing." End quote. Here we can perhaps begin to sense the tensions between the past and the present that Sheeler was aware of, and of the larger contradiction of a historic moment in which people simultaneously celebrated the American past as a model, and yet reworked history to better fit present concerns. In Sheeler's late works, we can see his interest in both new technology and imagery of the past. In 1946, he had begun to experiment with composite photography as a basis for his paintings. He superimposed photographic negatives, sometimes reversing them, to arrive at comp uh, compositions that look nearly cinematic. The heavy, the heavy machinery of the US steel plant in Pittsburgh the hulking abandoned mills of Massachusetts and New Hampshire, and a Shaker building that had been expanded by renovations and additions over time. They're all rendered with an extremely delicate touch. The paint is applied thinly and precisely, and in several areas is lightly outlined in pencil. Here, I think we can get a, sen a sense of Sheeler's interest in opposites, something particularly evocative in his use of the negative to make these works. These paintings are heavy and light. They combine the use of photography and painting, which Alfred Stieglitz had firmly defined as opposites. And particularly, this work on a shaker theme, which recedes and comes forward in space, an illusion created by Schiller's brilliant use of color and overlapping shapes, seems to waver between historic and modern. So I just want to wrap up this discussion of um, different ideas of the past in the work of these three different artists um, by dwelling a little bit on the tension between past and present that I think we can really see in the work of Charles Sheeler. One of the reasons that the concept of the usable past from this period is problematic is because it tends to insist not only in kind of cherry picking certain facts from the past, but also in creating one coherent narrative that would lead all the way from, say, New England furniture all the way up to Charles Sheeler with no interruptions. Um, here in the Art of the Americas department, we have the opportunity to do the opposite of that, to tell stories about multiple different types of pasts. So when we, when we look at something like a um, Pennsylvania German uh, chest in our collection, we can also think about uh, an 18th century um, chest made in New Spain. We can think about New England and New Spain at the same time. I mentioned earlier that um, we can think of someone like William Merritt Chase as a precursor to abstract painting. 
But it's also possible, um, if we're thinking about the 19th century, to find different sources for abstraction, perhaps in the graphic Native American um, work that we see in this parflesh um, on the right. If we're still thinking about the 19th century, um, we can also think thematically um, about the uses of different materials, the way that we learned um, about Dove combining um, very contemporary shapes with very old media, wax and tempera. This is something that I think about when I look at uh, a window by someone like John Lafarge who experimented continuously with different media and even patented different techniques of using glass. The theme of nostalgia, which comes up in the work of all three of these artists, um, particularly either during um, or in between wars or in dealing with the trauma of war, I also see in the work of someone like Winslow Homer, who was relying on nostalgic themes after the Civil War. And finally, if we're thinking about um, that third floor of modern art, we can remind ourselves that what we call the interwar period also overlaps with major global conflicts um, throughout the Americas. So in this case, the Mexican Revolution and the trauma of it are going on within the same period that um, Sheeler and Dove uh, and Hartley are all working. And so in this case, we can think not only about one type of modernism, um, but about how different forms of modernism are formed around the same time across different cultures. For me, this um, example is particularly resonant um, because Mexican muralists, similar to what um, Dove is doing in his sort of um, experiments with media, they made it a priority to break away from oil on canvas. And I wonder if that is just an example of a larger theme that was affecting artists throughout the Americas, whether they were based in Mexico City or in New York or in Cleveland. Um, and so one of the, um, one of the mandates of, of muralism was to make art more public by making it larger, but it also incorporated the use of fresco, a very old historic uh, media that Diego Rivera had learned in, in Italy. Um, this uh, combination, if we're thinking about Mexican modernism and, and some of the sort of New York City modernisms that we've talked about today, um, we have very literal examples of those two things um, interacting, particularly in photography, in, in the lives of all three of these artists, largely because of their associations with Stieglitz, but also, I think, because they were trying to get away from working specifically in oil on canvas in whatever, um, whatever, way, whatever ever form that kind of took, either incorporating photography or other media. Um, Mexican photography is also in the same period enjoying incredibly innovative um, experimentation. So here what you're seeing on the left is a work by Mexican photographer Manuel Alvarez Bravo um, created not too long after um, Schiller's magnificent staircase. So I very much hope that as we continue to refine some of our ideas within Making Modern and within our um, collection of modern painting, I hope that we can think about these multiple modernities and their intersections. Thank you so much. And if anyone has any questions or would like to go back to certain images, I'm happy to do that. Hi. I thought it was a great lecture. Um, Thank you. Two questions on Dove. Yeah. One, I, I'm not sure, but I thought I heard you reference his first wife. Yes. And you didn't, I didn't hear you say anything about his second wife or other wife. So it, right. just a so question. Right. So his second wife is Helen Tor. His second wife is the artist Helen Tor. So she's the one um, oh, I see. So you who showed a picture they lived the on the boat together. And um, okay. we have this beautiful installation. They're roughly about the same size, too. Um, the two works, if you go to our Axelrod gallery um, on the third floor, we have a painting by Dove hanging next to a painting by Tor. OK. So she, she, Tor was his second wife. Yes, okay, exactly. His you. first wife was a woman from his hometown, um, this one. So okay. Thank that's you. her painting right there. And then my other question, 
uh, is any thoughts on the vacuum cleaner in the critics? Oh, that's such a good question. The collages are so um, amazing, I think. And uh, one of the reasons I have this attachment, I think, to Long Island, to the, um, the collage that I spent some time with, is because Irene, our paintings conservator, and I spent some actual time looking at it, and they are unbelievable things in person. Um, as you could imagine, they're really fragile, and so um, they probably won't become, be coming on view anytime soon, unfortunately. Irene joked that if we were to show it, it would be like in a dark room with one light for three weeks, but <laughs> seeing as how incredible um, this is, uh, I, you know, it might actually be worth it. It might be something worth suggesting. Um, but so the critic, so this is a, this is a portrait, um, as I mentioned, of an art critic. And um, he, Dove made a series of portraits, including of, of some of the figures that have come up today. So for example, there's, he also has a collage portrait of Stieglitz. Um, so it's from that series of work. Uh, one thing that I would say is that the notably not only is, does, is he holding a vacuum, which I think can um, refer to the kind of like sucking up of all different sorts of, of creativity in the world and then kind of like spitting it back out as dust. Um, but he's also on roller skates, which is really interesting because Dove and Helen Tor, you know, we recited a few of their kind of unusual places they lived in like a boat on a, in an abandoned post office. They also lived in a roller rink, in an abandoned roller rink for a little while. So, you know, I would, I th and I think it's, it might be, it might be around that period when they were momentarily in this or possibly a little bit later. But I think that um, it has to do with the kind of unwieldy, unwieldiness um, and the sort of, uh, the, the, the cleaning sucking um, association with a vacuum. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, thank you, Layla. Thank you so much. <laughs>